Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I think there are at least a couple people in the audience. I know Peter, Jonathan, Rudy, who I think have heard some some version of this talk once before. So I'm I'm sorry about that. I, I mean it's it's probably a little bit different from the last time you heard it, but there'll be some some repeat as well. Um, so um, yeah, here's a here's an outline of what what I'm planning to talk about. So I'm going to start with a kind of introduction to the moduli space of flat connections on a on a surface. And um, yeah, there, this this moduli space is is very interesting. It has interesting topology and so on. And in this talk, I'm going to be talking about its about its K theory. Um, so the next thing I'm going to be talk I'm going to talk about are is a particularly interesting K theory class on on the moduli space that's going to come from a family of, of elliptic operators on, on the surface. And, um, and then I'll talk about how you can, can, how you can extract sort of uh, something more concrete, something like a numerical invariant from, from those K-theory classes. So for example, you can use this to distinguish K-theory classes. And, um, and I'll also show you how to calculate it explicitly in the simplest in the case of a simplest surface, namely a, a disk. Okay, and then um, at, at the end, depending on how much time there is, I'll tell you a little bit about how to calculate it in general um, for a general surface, uh, and that will yeah, so that will involve something called non-abelian localization, and and then I'll I'll finish by by showing you what the general formula looks like when when the dust settles and you you do the calculation. Um, okay, so let's start with the moduli space of flat connections on a surface. So um, yeah, let me start with a bit of notation. So sigma, sigma is going to be a compact connected Riemann surface. So something like something like this. And it's allowed to have boundary. This is, this is going to be really important for me. Um, the surface is allowed to have boundary. And in so, at some point, actually, I'll assume that it has at least one boundary component. Um, and I'm also going to fix a compact connected, the connected simple Lie group. Um, and if you like, you can just pretend throughout the talk that this is SU2 or SUN, um, but uh, everything works in, in this degree of generality as well. Um, and, I'll, and I'll also, I won't need this for, for a while, but um, I'm also going to fix an invariant inner product on the Lie algebra. And I'm going to be using, I didn't write it down, but I'm going to be using what people sometimes call the basic inner product. So the, uh, the inner product, the invariance condition, um, and the fact that we're dealing with a simple Lie algebra means that the inner product is determined up to a scale factor, completely determined up to a scale factor. And there's some canonical scaling that you use such that the, I forget, the, the short co-roots have length, have squared length too. There's some canonical scaling. So I'm going to be using that one just to, um, be very definite about it through the whole talk. And uh, I won't need this for a while, but, but let me almost also fix the maximal torus while I'm at it in a positive, positive chamber in the, in the Lie algebra of the maximal torus. Okay. And um, so here's, here's the moduli space that we're talking about. We'll call it M sigma. And what we do is we look at all uh, the algebra valued one forms on the surface, which you should really think of as a connection on the trivial bundle over the surface, the trivial G bundle, just sigma cross G over the surface. Um, so I look at connections whose curvature is zero. This is, this is the curvature of the connection. Um, and that's, that's some infinite dimensional space, but then I can divide out by the action of the gauge group. So the gauge group acts on this, on this space in the usual way. So, so, so G sigma here is just maps from sigma into G. Again, because I'm, I'm going to be working throughout with with the trivial bundle over sigma, just sigma times g. So the gauge group is just maps from sigma into g, and, and it acts on this space, and you can, you can form the quotient. And what you end up with is something that's uh, compact, finite dimensional, uh, singular, usually singular. Yeah. But anyways, this is, this, is, uh, this is the moduli space of thought connections on sigma. And there's another description that you you might have encountered before. So a flat connection is, is determined by uh, up, up to gauge transformations by its holonomies. 
uh, around around say a set of um, set of generators for the fundamental group. And so there's this other description where you look at uh, group homomorphisms from the fundamental group of your surface into the into the group G, and then you divide out by by conjugation. So, um, but mostly mostly I'm actually going to use I think entirely actually I'll just use this this description. This this description fits better with what I'm going to say. And um, at least when the surface is closed, when there's no boundary, there's yet another uh, picture of this space. There's yet another way of thinking about this space uh, involving GIT. So this is this is also the, the GIT moduli space of um, semi-stable uh, GC bundles. If if GC is the complexification. So of the group G, but I won't I won't mention that uh, anymore at all. Okay. Now um, let's talk about uh, the D bar operator associated to a connection. So if you have a connection connection one form like this, and um, let me also fix some finite dimensional complex representation of the group. If you if you like, I don't know what people's background are. So if you like, if if you're thinking of G equals SU2, um, you can just take V equal to C2 throughout the talk to make it very, very concrete. Okay. Um, so a, a connection one form gives you a connection operator like this. You just take the uh, exterior derivative plus the connection one form. And yeah, so that's an operator from zero forms with values in the representation to one forms with values in the representation. Here, here I'm using, I didn't make it part of the notation, but I'm using, using the fact that A takes values in the Lie algebra to let it act on this, on this representation of the group. And then, okay, so this is, this is a nice operator, but then what I'm actually going to do is take the zero one component of this operator. So this operator lands in the space of all one forms on the surface, but my surface has a complex structure. So the one forms split up into one zero forms plus zero one forms. And I can project onto the zero one part and that gives me this operator DA bar. Now I'm gonna refer to this as the D bar so operator associated to, to A. And um, this, this map that takes a connection and gives you a, a D bar operator like this, it's equivalent for, for the gauge group. If you, if you change the connection by gauge transformation and you also um, conjugate these, these vector spaces by um, the corresponding element of the gauge group, uh, then, then this family doesn't, doesn't change. Okay. And, um, if, if the boundary of, of this uh, surface is empty, then this is a Fredholm operator. Okay, I'll, I'll say something about Fredholm operators in, in a moment, but um, this, this corresponds to this, this something that we learn in, in complex analysis. Um, that, that for example, if you have a, if you have a compact, manif compact complex manifold and, and, and a holomorphic vector bundle, then, um, the space of holomorphic sections is uh, finite dimensional. Okay, and um, okay, I'll say again. Again, I'll say more about this in a moment. But but if you have a family of Fredholm operators uh, over a space, ah, sorry, so I said it a little bit backwards. So because because this family of operators is is G sigma equivariant, it descends to a family of operators over the moduli space. Remember, the moduli space was the quotient of space of clock connections by gauge transformations. So this, this family descends to a family of Fredholm operators over this moduli space. And, and such a family gives you a K-theory class. So, so this, this construction, these observations here tell us that we get a K-theory class that I'm gonna call E sigma V um, that lives in the K-theory of the moduli space. Okay. And, and I put a little picture of uh, this, um, this famous paper by Etienne Bot in the in the bottom right hand corner because um, at least in the, in the case that the surface is closed, uh, i.e. doesn't have a boundary, um, Etienne Bot already introduced introduced these classes. 
And uh, they also, for example, took the churn character of this class and, and um, that, that was involved in their study of the cohomology of, of the moduli space. Okay. Can I, ask, uh, can I ask a possibly tangential question? Okay. Yeah, I was sure. just wondering. So, so the, um, I mean, the cohomology of the moduli space you you can you can compute by uh, by by Morse theory. Is and I was just wondering, is there a similar algorithm for computing the K theory? Can can you compute K theory by by Morse theory? Not not necessarily in this specific moduli space case, just in general. Oh, uh, that's a good question. I I've seen some papers about this, but. Um... Yeah, I've seen some papers about this, but um, yeah, but it, but it's but it's been a while. It's been a while. So yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. the answer yes, because uh, rationally, because Morse theory computes rational cohomology, and rationally, uh, there's an isomorphism between cohomology and K theory. Um, so, but in fact. K theory is in fact a little bit better because Euler classes tend to be invertible. So there's it's actually in some ways a nicer computation. That's a good question. Yeah. So, but mm -hmm. you could definitely read off the rational K theory off of uh, off of the Morse theory. But uh, in right. fact, the computation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, but but Morse theory only computes rational homology, so you could hardly expect it to compute integral K theory. Uh, right. um, in fact, things are a little bit better because there's, for instance, a nice paper I'm trying to think of Harada and Paul Selick, and I can't remember if Jeffrey was in on it or not. They had a series of papers on that where the, the nice properties, the nice properties of the Euler class in K theory is something they used. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt, but since you asked, thank you. No, no, th thank you very much. That, that was that Jonathan. I think that was Jonathan. I recognize your voice. Anyway, yeah, I I remember seeing this paper involving Harada as well, but. I didn't want to say it unless if I didn't remember the title or something, but um, yeah. Um, okay. Um, uh, yeah. So, so I was going to say a little bit, a tiny bit more about K theory um, and Fred Home operators. I promised to say something about that again. I don't, I don't know what people's uh, background is. Um, so, so say I have a let's take a Hilbert space of of infinite dimension. Um, an operator, an operator, say a bounded linear operator from H to itself is Fred Holm. If both its kernel and its co-kernel, this is the co-kernel, by the way, if you haven't run into this before, if both of those vector spaces are, are finite dimensional. Okay. And in this case, you can define what's called the index of the operator, which is just the difference of, of those two dimensions. So it's some, some integer. Um, there's there's a space of Fred Holm operators. You can look at all the all the bounded linear operators on H that are Fred Holm. Equip that with a norm topology. And um, the K theory of, of a topological space X is defined to be the set of homotopy classes from X into this, this space of Fred Holm operators. Okay. And you might you might have heard at some point you might have heard a different definition of K theory, um, which is that if if you have a com and okay, and it, it agrees with this if, if you have a compact space at least. Okay, so if you if you have a compact space, it's common to define K theory as uh, well. Okay, I wrote it down here. It's a bit of a mouthful, but the growth integral group of the monoid of complex vector bundles on on your space X. Okay, and if X is compact, then there's a theorem um, due to a Tia Janich that says that um, that that this definition agrees agrees with this, this definition, but uh, but if you talk to a topologist, they will say that for a general space, you should you should use this definition. For example, if, if X is some infinite dimensional space, you should definitely use, use this definition. Okay. And, and roughly how this how this relationship goes, maybe I should mention it, is um, if you have a family of Fredholm operators over, over a compact space, then you can always perturb the family a little bit so that its kernel and its co-kernel are uh, of constant dimension. You have a family of Fredholm operators. In general, the kernel and the co-kernel can both uh, fluctuate in dimension as you move around uh, in your space. Um, but on, at least over a compact space, you can always perturb them so that they have constant dimension. 
and then um, and then the vector bundle is obtained by just taking the bundle of kernels and the bundle of, of co-kernels, basically. That gives you two vector bundles and, and uh, the corresponding class here is the difference, the formal difference of those two vector bundles. But in a non-compact space, uh, in general, this, this doesn't work. Um, for, for example, your, your kernel, the dimension of your kernel might not have any lower bound as you vary the points in the space and then, and then you're kind of in trouble. Okay, so so yeah, so this is kind of important. I'm going to be working with classes that that uh, fit in this this version of K theory. They they definitely do not fit in this version of K theory. Yeah. I'm I'm going to be yeah. We already talked about yeah. I'm going to be working with spaces that are not compact and so on. Okay, um, right. So I want to go back to. To, to this issue. So, so I mentioned, let me actually go back two slides. So I mentioned that if the boundary is empty, if the boundary of your surface is empty, then this operator is Fred Holm. We need Fred Holm operators to get K3 classes. The boundaries, if the boundary is not empty, this just doesn't work. We have to do something, we have to do something else. Um, and what we're going to do is, is impose a boundary condition. Okay. So Let's look at what happens on the disk because that actually is will give us good intuition what what to do in general. So if we look at the b bar operator on the disk, its kernel is is infinite dimensional. Okay, so it's definitely not a Fred Holm operator. For example, all of these all of these holomorphic functions they're all in the kernel of of this operator. Okay, but um, there's a neat way to cut it down to finite dimensions. It's not it's not really so unique, but but it's possible to do. What we do is we impose a boundary condition. So instead of looking at arbitrary functions in the kernel of this operator, we require the functions uh, to to satisfy this condition. So if we take the function and we restrict it to the boundary of the disk, we ask that it uh, only have a negative Fourier coefficients. Yeah, so the restriction of the function to the disk is some function on the circle. So we can expand it in a Fourier series. And we ask that all the positive Fourier coefficients, all the non-negative Fourier coefficients are zero. Okay. And th that will, will actually rule out all of these functions, right? Because um, if I restrict a z to the boundary, I get e to the i theta. And that has a positive Fourier coefficient. So this boundary condition is ruling it out. So what I'm going to do is uh, impose this boundary condition. So I'm not going to look at sort of the, uh, the, the, most, the most fully extended uh, operator, D bar operator. I'm going to restrict it to this, uh, to this subspace that I'm going to write like this. So here, here I'm talking about functions on the disk that satisfy this boundary condition. Okay. And this, this modified operator where I've now restricted the domain this, this operator is now, now Fred Holm, and in fact, its, its kernel is just zero because, as, as I just mentioned, um, this, this boundary condition here rules out all of, all of these guys. Okay, and, and I'm using this, this funny notation for this boundary condition here because, um, well, the, the way you should think about it is that um, uh, uh, these, 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 um, these functions here with n and negative, they're in the, um, they have negative eigenvalue for this operator, this operator one over i d by d theta on, on the circle. Okay, so that, that's the meaning of this notation here. The, this operator on the boundary tells you, tells you what, the, what the boundary condition is. Okay, okay. Um, on a general surface, we, we do the same thing. So for every, for every connection now, we look at we look at the operator not on the full space of, of functions, but uh, we restrict it to this subspace of, of functions such that the restriction to every boundary component has only negative Fourier modes, only strictly negative Fourier modes. Okay, um, and this this operator is is Fred Holm, and um, this is essentially what, what people call the atiyah Petodi singer boundary condition in, in kind of a very simple case. You know, for a surface, it's much simpler than, 
than for a general um, manifold. Um, maybe just one comment about that is that in the Atiyah Patoti Singer boundary condition, um, you, usually what you do is that the boundary condition is sort of determined by the operator in a certain way. And that's not exactly what I'm doing here because, because my operator is varying, whereas I want to keep the boundary fixed uh, independent of the operator. So um, yeah, so, so strictly speaking, um, when, when the connection is say zero on the boundary or in the neighborhood of the boundary, then, then this is literally the Atiyah Patoti Singer boundary condition. Okay, and but but away from that, it's it's a little bit a little bit different, strictly speaking. Okay, and this this business about keeping the boundary condition fixed is is um, crucial if you want to get a family of uh, Fred home operators that varies in a continuous way. Okay. By the way, these operators are now Fred home, but they're not injective, unlike unlike the example you showed us in the previous slide, right? Right. Right. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Um, Oops. Okay. Um, okay. So now uh, an interesting thing happens. So we have we now have a Fred Home family over the space of flat connections, and the next question to ask, if if we're kind of following the route that a T and Bach did, is um, does this family descend to the moduli space? And it doesn't quite, unfortunately. Um, the thing is that uh, the initial family of D bar operators was was fully G sigma, fully gauge echovariant. Uh, but once we impose the boundary condition, it's not anymore. So the boundary condition destroys that a little bit. And um, the reason is, is not so hard to see. Uh, basically, if you, if you trans transform this family of operators by an arbitrary gauge transformation, this operator just gets gauge transformed as well. Here, here G, G partial is just the restriction of the gauge transformation to the boundary. Okay. Um, but, but we can still go part of the way. So I just take this, the subgroup of the gauge group that's trivial along the boundary. In fact, you can do, you can do a little bit more than this, right? Um, this, uh, this thing will be invariant this this thing will will just return to where it started as long as uh, my gauge transformation is constant along the boundary. Uh, its derivative should be should be zero along the boundary. Okay, so you can do a little bit better, but anyways, I'm just going to take this this subgroup of the gauge group, and um, and and so this family will descend to a family of Fredholm operators over over this space, which I'm calling kind of calligraphic M to distinguish it from the previous. Uh, straight M. Um, so, so this is the, the space of flat connections modulo this, this big, uh, big normal subgroup of the gauge group. Okay. So I get, I get a K-theory class on, on that space. And in fact, because of this um, additional equivariance that I mentioned up here, that, that actually um, just being constant along the boundary is enough. In, in fact, it's, it's an element in the equivariant K-theory of this um, this space. I get, I get um, a family that's equivariant for gauge transformations that are uh, constant along each of the boundary. Sorry, uh, how am I saying that? Uh, I, get, I get something that's equivariant for, for the quotient of um, what you might call G con sigma, the ones that are constant along each component of the boundary by um, G sigma, partial sigma. Um, Okay, and that and that quotient, I really should just write this out. Okay, so you you, you end up with a family that's equivariant for the group uh, that you might call maybe G con sigma. These these are the ones that are constant along each component of the boundary mod mod this group. And and this thing is isomorphic to G to the power B if if B is just the number of boundary components. Okay, um, yeah, so you get you get something in the equivariant key theory. And another another nice thing which which happens and, and is sort of the reason why I didn't I didn't divide out by this whole group is that um, this quotient is actually smooth. It's infinite dimensional, um, but it's but it's actually smooth. So this this subgroup of the gauge group acts uh, freely and properly on on the space of flat connections. Okay. 
Um, okay, so so I also at the same time uh, escape get away from this issue that we had before that the moduli space might not be smooth. Um, okay. And okay, this is this is not going to play a huge role in the in the talk, but um, this this manifold m sigma here is an example of what people call a proper Hamiltonian loop group space. So um, and and these go back um, to mine Rankin and and Woodward. Um, so yeah, so they're smooth infinite dimensional manifolds with an action of the of the loop group, or here it's some power of the loop group. Okay, here, here the way the way the loop group the loop group acts the loop group is like the leftover um, the leftover group action. We had the gauge action on the space of flat connections, and um, we divide it out by things that are constant along the boundary. Sorry, um, the identity along the boundary. So we're left with this with this loop group action. If you have if you have some element in the loop group, the way it acts on this space is you um, you use the simple connectedness of the group that I assumed at the beginning to um, contract that loop uh, to the identity that lets you extend uh, your gauge transformation from say a boundary, um, some component of the boundary to the interior of the surface. And, um, and, and that gives you the action on M sigma. It's well defined, it doesn't depend on the choice of extension and so on. Um, and that's, that's how it works. Okay, but in, in addition to the loop group action, there's also a, a symplectic form. This goes back to a Tia bot. And uh, there's a moment map. Uh, this this action here um, has a moment map. So there's a there's a proper map from from m sigma to um, the dual of the algebra of the loop group that just takes a connection and restricts it to the boundary. Okay, you pull you take the connection and pull it back to the boundary. And um, yeah, right. A another remark is that. Um, you can recover the finite dimensional moduli spaces by doing further symplectic reduction. So, um, so for example, if you reduce it zero, you get you get the moduli space associated to the surface that you you obtain by uh, capping off the boundary, just adding adding disks to each of the boundary components to get a closed surface. Okay. But uh, yeah, but I won't say much much more about that in this in this talk. But but the the work I'm telling you about has has some kind of generalization to, to more general Hamiltonian loop group spaces and suitable K-theory classes on them. Okay, um, so let me kind of recap a little bit what, what, uh, what I said so far. Um, so I fixed I fixed a representation of the group and and a compact Riemann surface with possibly with boundary like this. Um, I define this space. M sigma, which is infinite dimensional, but smooth. And there's this nice, uh, so there's this nice family of Fredholm operators over the space of flat connections, and it descends, it's equivariant for this group, so it descends to some family of Fredholm operators over this space, and it gives you a class in the in the equivariant T3 of this of this space. Okay. And another comment that I snuck in at the bottom here is that um, if, if ultimately you're just interested in the K-theory classes on the moduli spaces for closed surfaces, this is still relevant. This is still relevant because if you take if you take this class on, on, this, on this larger space and restrict it to the zero level of the moment map, then it it, it descends to, to the quotient. Yeah, I just I said on the previous slide that this thing is a symplectic quotient. Set that backwards. This thing is a symplectic quotient. Yeah. So, so these these classes on these bigger spaces descend to the classes that you might be interested on, uh, interested in on the on the moduli space for the closed surface. Okay. So even if you were just interested in the closed surfaces, and I'd like to make the case that you shouldn't be. You should be interested in the surfaces with boundary too. Uh, but even if you were just interested in the closed surfaces, um, studying these classes is still uh, interesting. Okay. Okay. So the next, the next kind of step, we have, we have um, these interesting K-theory classes now. Uh, the next step is that um, I'd like to explain how you can extract 
something like a numerical invariant from these K theory classes. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe um, a map that I'm calling index TK. It's actually a family. It depends on a, on a parameter K, which is a non-negative integer. It's going to go from the equivariant K theory of this space to uh, the space that I'm calling R minus infinity T. This is, I should have written this down. This is just the set of all um, infinite formal linear combinations. So the set of all sums, sum over the weight lattice of the torus, uh, some integer times the character um, where uh, this n lambdas can be any, any integers. So it's a set of all formal, formal linear combinations like, like that. Okay. Um, yeah, so the map, the map is going to go from the equivariant K theory of, of, this, of this space to, uh, to this kind of completion of the representation ring of, of T. So this, this will be now not a ring anymore, right? Be because there's no restriction on the support. Exactly. Yeah. And you don't want to put some kind of cone support on the uh, cone support condition on to, to make it a ring. No. Maybe not. Okay. No. No. Yeah. So I. So I'm just. Uh, yeah. So. So it's just going to be. Treat. I'm just going to treat it as. Uh, well, I guess I'll treat it as an R, a module over or R of T. Um, yeah. Um, but that's that's a good question. Um, and and sort of at a minimum, so one one application, one kind of minimal application is that you can use this to show that that certain classes in here are non-trivial, for example, or that two class certain classes in here are different from each other. That's kind of a minimal minimal thing you might use such a map for. Um, but but maybe a bit more interesting is that um, yeah, it, it it connects with 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 the story that I was just explaining about. Um, about uh, how these classes are related to the classes that you get on the surfaces where you cap off the boundary. So at least when, when you take this parameter k to be large, it will turn out that um, when you take the t invariant part of this index, yeah, you, you, take the, um, you take the integer here that fits inside of the trivial character, that, that will agree with, with an index map defined on the, on the moduli space of the closed surface. And, and, that, and that thing is, is something that's um, easier to understand because, because that's a finite dimensional space. And um, yeah, so, so this is something that you can def define by more uh, conventional, conventional means. For example, you can, in algebraic geometry, they would, they would define this as the Euler characteristic of, of um, Euler characteristic in sheaf cohomology. Okay, I won't, I won't say a, a lot about that. Um, that, that would maybe be something for a separate talk to explain that, but, um, but, but this is sort of another application. Where, where this parameter k comes in, k is going to be the power, maybe as this notation suggests, k is going to be the power of, of a pre-quantum line bundle on, on this space. And so really you get a family of, of, of maps like this, depending on what power of the pre-quantum line bundle you take. And, and this result is kind of a, a quantization commutes with reduction result that holds at least for large powers of the pre-quantum line bundle. Okay. And okay, so so I'm going to a lot of the rest of the talk will be about explaining what this map what this map is. This is this is sort of a preview. Um, but one one comment I want to make is that um, to be completely honest, um, the map is not going to be defined on the whole K theory group. And that, that's sort of the reason I put this little prime here, which probably looked like a table, but, but was not. <laughs> um, it's not going to be defined on this entire group. Um, this is kind of, yeah, this is kind of an interesting question that's, that's still kind of mysterious to me, but, but um, to make the map work, I'm going to need to impose some kind of equivariant bounded geometry condition on, on these K-theory classes. Um, and uh, there's going to be a subring of the full K theory group that satisfies this condition and on which the index map is, is well defined. And these, these classes that we care about E sigma Vs satisfy the condition. So, um, so we're in, in, in a good, we'll, we'll be perfectly fine when it comes to computing these things. Um, but uh, yeah, but this is, this is maybe a technical, technical point. Okay. So for an example of, oh, sorry. Yes. Well, no, keep on going, sorry. 
oh, I, I was going to mention that an example of, of something that does not satisfy this this um, this bounded geometry condition it will be the pre-quantum line bundle itself. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's kind of funny. The pre-quantum line bundle seems kind of tame compared to these classes that are built from families of um, elliptic operators, but um, yeah, but 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 actually it fails this condition, <laughs> um, which is sort of the reason that I have this parameter k here, and 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 the pre-quantum line bundle is not just a built-in. Anyways, yeah. So so this, I'm not going to say very much more about this, but uh, but but just to be honest, um, yeah, that there's this is not a typo. Uh, I can't I can't define this on the entire. Group. Okay. Yeah. I was just Gonna ask yeah. you. So, um, this line bundle L, um, I mean, there's also a really popular line bundle on the loop group. Um, is it related to curly L? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's related. Um, yes, I'm not sure I can give you the textbook answer off the top of my head, but. Um, Yes, it's very much related. So one, maybe maybe one, oh, one, one comment I can make is that, um, actually I'll show you this um, in a minute. Uh, let's see, is it even on the next? No, it's not quite on the next slide, but, but one, one comment I can make is that when sigma is a disk, when sigma is a disk, this, this space is, is um, going to be a homogeneous space of the loop group. I'll say this again in, in two or three slides. Um, and the pre-quantum line bundle on it is, is the quotient of the line bundle on the loop group. Sweet, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, right. So, um, uh, yeah. So, so let me talk a bit about the construction of this of this map. Um, so the first the first thing that I'm going to do. Um, which is a little bit unfortunate. I wish I didn't have to do this, but um, m sigma is infinite dimensional, and um, analysis, index theory, and so on, very difficult, maybe impossible in infinite dimensions. So the first thing I'm going to do is cut down to finite dimensions. So maybe, maybe someday we'll understand sort of how to do index theory on spaces like m sigma, but for the moment, um, I, I do not, I at least do not know how to do that. So, so we're gonna cut down to finite dimensions somehow. Okay. Um, and the basic observation that I'm going to use is that um, every connection on a surface is gauge equivalent to one whose who's pullback to the boundary, just looks like some constant element in the Lie algebra of a maximal torus uh, times, times d theta, theta being, being the coordinate on the boundary. Um, yeah, so, so using, using this observation, th this observation is supposed to motivate what I'm going to say next. So, so I'm going to look at the subset of connections in M sigma, or really, okay, square brackets just means gauge equivalence class, because remember, M sigma is gauge equivalence classes of connections. I'm going to look at the subset whose restriction to the boundary is, is of this form. Is some constant in the Lie algebra of the maximal torus times d theta. Okay, so this is this is some subset of of m sigma, and um, be, because of because of this observation, everything in m sigma is gauge equivalent to something in this subset. Not unique, certainly not unique, but everything in m sigma is gauge equivalent to something in this subset. So the elements of this subset kind of represent all connections on sigma up to gauge transformations. Okay, not in a unique way, um, but but every you you could say every everything in here has. Uh, yeah, every everything in here is is gauge equivalent to something something in here. Okay, and um, another comment is that if you like this Hamiltonian loop group space picture, uh, this subset is just. The inverse image of uh, the dual of the Lie algebra of, of T uh, under the moment map. Okay. Um, some some properties of this set. Uh, one is that um, so it's not preserved by the whole the whole loop group. 
uh, but it's preserved by, by some subgroup of the loop group. I probably won't talk a whole lot about this, but, but um, the subgroup that's here is, uh, first of all, you can act by um, anything that's in the normalizer of the maximal torus. So, so any, uh, I should have said this, so any element of the group, you can think of as a constant loop. So the group G itself sits inside the loop group. And so in particular, the normalizer of the maximal torus inside G sits inside the loop group. Okay, so that, that acts on, on M sigma, sorry, X sigma. And um, another thing that acts on X sigma is, is this group that I'm calling pi. Pi is the set of uh, loops in the torus that are one parameter subgroups. So homomorphisms from the circle into P. That also acts on, on X sigma. So this is, this is a lattice, this lattice acts on X sigma. And some other properties to mention are that this X sigma is, is non-compact. And it's also, it's also singular. Okay, and it's, it's similar to something, if you're familiar with work of Duffy Purwan from, from the 90s, um, it's similar to what they call an extended, extended moduli space. Okay. And this business about it being singular, um, I'm going to kind, kind of sweep this under the rug. Um, so there's, there's a modification, if you really wanna do this, there's a modification of this space where you can uh, thicken it a little bit, so to speak. Uh, to get something non-singular and then work with that instead. Um, but, it's, but it's not really important to what, what I'm going to see in the rest of the talk. So I'm going to kind of sweep this under the rug, but it, it can be dealt with. The much more serious issue is that it's non-compact. Non I believe this was also true in Jeffrey Kerwan's work as well. So they, their extended moduli spaces were singular. Singularity was never that much of a problem, but the fact that it was non-compact was, was uh, more of an issue. Okay. Um, okay, so this, this is going to be the finite dimensional space I'm going to work with. And um, yes, okay. Um, the next thing, so, so where I'm going with this is that this, this index map will be a map that takes a K-theory class, couples it to uh, an elliptic operator, actually the spin C Dirac operator on, on this X sigma, and then takes its index, takes its index. Um, so the next thing that we need is, is, is an elliptic operator on this space. Well, actually a spin C Dirac operator on this space. So um, for a spin C Dirac operator, you need a spin C structure. You need what's called a spin C structure. So let me explain that a tiny bit. So this goes back to some uh, joint work uh, from a few years ago by myself and um, Mein Rankin and Yan Li Song, Eckhart Mein Rankin and Yan Li Song. And um, we constructed a spin C structure on, on this space X sigma. I'm going to pretend that X sigma is, is smooth to, for the purposes of the talk. Um, so really, really we worked on this fatten space that I, that I mentioned. Okay, and maybe just so that this is not uh, completely mystifying, I'll tell you very roughly the idea. Um, so the rough idea is that this, this big infinite dimensional manifold M sigma is symplectic. It's a symplectic manifold. So it has a compatible, almost complex structure as, as you normally do on a symplectic manifold. And then you can look at the normal bundle of, of, this, of this space X sigma. And if we pretend, so you remember I said that, said that, oh, I wrote it up here. I said that X sigma is just the inverse image of T star under the moment map. So if we pretend that mu is actually transverse in the sense of differential geometry to, to T star, then the normal bundle is this, okay? So I'm just going to pretend that it is actually transverse and the normal bundle really is this, okay? And, and then this, this factor bundle also has a complex structure, okay? You can, um, you can use the positive, the positive roots of the, the affine Lie algebra to, to define a, a, a complex structure on, on this vector space and, and hence on this vector bundle, okay? And, um, Spin C structures have this nice two out of three property, at least in finite dimensions. They have this nice two out of three property that if you have, if you have um, three vector bundles uh, sitting in a short exact sequence and, and two out of the three have a spin C structure, you get a spin C structure on the third. Okay, so that, that's the idea of how you, how you obtain a spin C structure on X sigma. And um, yeah, and, and, and this, 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 this work here is, is largely about making this idea rigorous in, in infinite dimensions. 
so um, yeah. So so this this gives some canonical spin C structure on on X sigma. And you can get you can get further spin C structures by twisting by powers of a pre-quantum pre-quantum line bundle. So this this M sigma has a pre-quantum line bundle, and um, and any spin C structure you can twist it by by a complex line bundle to obtain a new spin C structure. Okay, so that's the spin C structure, and then as I said, but sigma um, is is finite dimensional. I, I I suddenly like forgot. Yes, X sigma is finite dimensional. Yeah. Okay. Uh, M sigma is infinite dimensional. Um, so um, yeah, so that's yeah, so, so so that's that's where the the infinite dimensionality comes in. X sigma is finite dimensional, but but um, the infinite dimensional stuff that we were worried about uh, when we were writing this, uh, yeah, has has more to do with M M sigma. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, like in particular, like one one thing that goes wrong in infinite dimensions is that. Um, representation the representation of the Clifford algebra is not unique, highly highly non-unique. Um, so you have to worry that, like, like, like if you think about the two out of three property for spin C structures in finite dimensions, at some point you're using the fact that it's that it's unique, that it's basically unique, and representations of the Clifford algebra are basically unique in finite dimensions. Okay, so that that's sort of one one worry. Okay, um, so so as I said. Uh, yeah, th th this index map. Um, okay, so now now we have the spin C Dirac operator, and the, the this index map that that I want to tell you about is um, is really uh, take take the K theory class, couple it to your to your spin C Dirac operator, and then take the index of that. Um, there's there's quite a bit of justification of. Uh, needed to, to, to really do this because um, although although for example although this x sigma is finite dimensional it's non-compact and in general in general if you have a Dirac operator on a non-compact space um, you're not guaranteed that it's fred home okay but in in this case it is it is fred home or rather I should say that it's 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 fred home in the sense that um, if you look at the t action on the kernel and the co-kernel the multiplicity of each representation of of the torus of t is is finite is finite yeah so you can you can define an index that lives in this uh, completion of the representation ring yeah. um, but but then but otherwise it really is the l2 index so i really take the l2 kernel of this of this operator and uh, the l2 kernel of its adjoint if you like and um and and uh, this the, the image of this map is the formal difference of those two things viewed as elements in here. And I've kind of uh, another thing I should maybe say is that I've kind of written notation here as though my k-theory class is a vector bundle. I've kind of used notation as though the k-theory class is a vector bundle, but it it works it works also for these k-theory classes that I that I introduced before, where instead of a finite dimensional vector bundle, we actually have some uh, bundle of Hilbert spaces and some family of Fredholm operators on the on the on those Hilbert spaces. Um, so then 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 what you have to do really is, is take your Dirac operator on X sigma and basically couple it to this uh, family of Fredholm operators on the fibers of the Hilbert bundle. And you're really taking the index of that that operator. Okay. Um, yeah. So um so if you have a so if we're just on the disk um do you for representation v of you know the group um does this return like the character of the uh level k or like lift of that representation to the loop group or oh that's that's a really good question um uh you can you can extract that from from here so uh if i understand right so so if um yeah, if you take e to be, uh, if you take there to be no e at all, which is allowed, yeah, you, see, you can take no e at all. Um, then um, what 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 the output will be will be um, the numerator of the character formula for the corresponding uh, representation of the loop group. So the, the numerator of the character formula, um, if you restrict to q q equals one, like q q being the the um, 
the rotation variable, um, that then it will be something in here. And and um, and that's what it will be. Yeah, so, so it'll be, yeah, so if you get rid of the E here and, and you take the index of this, um, and, and you're, sorry, and you're looking at the disk ah. case, um, yeah, then, then uh, the output will will indeed be uh, the numerator of the character of the positive. So like that normal bundle is the valid denominator that you've thrown out somehow. Yes, that. yes, yes, that's a very good way of thinking about it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, excellent question. Um, okay, yeah, so let me actually finally come back to the disk. <laughs> Let's see exactly what happens on the on the disk. Well, modulo, modulo a couple of lemmas that, that I'm just going to tell you. Um, so in the case of a disk, uh, this, this space is, um, is, is, as I said, it's just this homogeneous space of the loop group. You can, you can think of it as the, the orbit of, of the point zero uh, under the loop group, under the action of the loop group, the gauge, the gauge action of the loop group, or, or if you like the, the, um, the action, um, the co-joint action in, inside the dual of the affine, the algebra. And, um, and um, yeah, so by the way, the reason for this is just because, um, basically because um, uh, a, connection, a connection on the circle, connection on the circle is determined up to gauge transformations by its holonomy around the circle, okay, so by, by some element in the group. And um, if, if your connection on the circle, it must, if your connection on the circle extends into the interior of the disk, then the holonomy has to be trivial, okay? And um, and um, yeah, and 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 so then, yeah. The, the, this means that up to gauge transformations, we only care about the connections on the boundary that have that are gauge equivalent to the zero connection that that have trivial holonomy. In other words, okay. So that, that that's why this space is the same thing as the orbit of zero under the under the group. Okay. This this space x sigma is is the discrete space. It's just a copy of this lattice. Maybe I should write this out again, but but pi was um, the lattice of, of group homomorphisms from the circle into the H1. Um, okay, uh, but I'm I guess I should uh, I forgot to mention this, but I can view this as a subset of of T or of T star of, of the Lie algebra in the usual way, and and so that's. That's um, that's how I'm thinking of it as a subset of, of this space here. Okay. So anyway, so this this space is as simple as it could be. It's just the discrete space. Um, it's it's well, it's it's a lattice. Happens to be a lattice, but anyways, it's the discrete space. Now, of course, any any differential operator on a discrete space is zero. So the Jarrett operator is zero. Uh, but 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 it acts it acts on something uh, non-trivial, nevertheless. So it, it acts on this pre-quantum line bundle. Uh, and I mentioned I mentioned this a moment. A moment ago, uh, in response to a question. So the pre-quantum line bundle is is induced from this um, from the central extension of the loop group, and then there's some other factors. Um, so, so this this other factor, which I won't say anything about, this is this is a correction factor because this case is not transverse. We're in the non-transverse case, unfortunately. I've been pretending up to now that it's transverse, but but okay, you have to stick in a correction factor because um, it's not transverse. Fine. Um, and then the index, because it's a discrete space, we can just we can just calculate it. So it's going to be a sum over the points in the discrete space. Uh, this this j here is the vile the vile denominator. It comes from this correction factor. Um, I won't worry about it. And then um, this this contribution comes from the pre-quantum line bundle. And uh, and then uh, we we have a family of operators over this discrete space. We just take their indices. So so that's what's appearing here. So we take the index of this of this t-bar operator, the t-equivariant index of this t-bar operator, um, over each of the points in this discrete space. Okay, and and my no notation here, alpha is running over this over this lattice, which I'm thinking of as living in t. And uh, for each each one of those um, each one of those uh, connections on the boundary, constant connections on the boundary, you have to extend it somehow um, into the interior of the disk. So that that's what I'm calling alpha tilde. It's only, only, only well defined up to up to gauge transformations. Okay, but but the index doesn't depend on which which class you take. Yeah. Or sorry, which which representative you take. Okay. 
Okay, so this this is the formula, and then so I need a lemma. You can you can calculate everything's pretty explicit, so you can calculate what the index of, of these operators are, and you get a kind of nice result. So what you get is um, you take basically the derivative of the of the character of the representation uh, paired paired with this uh, covert alpha. Okay, and um, yeah, so 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 here's the explicit formula. So if you write if you write out your character as some sum over some integers times uh, e to the lambda, then uh, this this derivative just pulls down this factor of of lambda paired with alpha. So this is again some element in in R of T in the representation ring of T. Okay. So that's that's how it works out. It takes a bit of bit of work, I guess, to to show this, but. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's that's how it works out. So the index the index looks like this. I just substituted that formula into the expression. And now, okay, now we're going to follow this. Uh, I forgot if I mentioned this at the beginning, but 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 the stuff I'm telling you about today is related to some work of Tellum and Woodward. So now I'm borrowing an idea from them. Um, and one of their ideas um, was that uh, you get. Um, you get a very interesting formula if instead of looking at these K theory classes on their own, you look at these kind of generating series of K theory classes. So let's we introduce a formula variable. It's boring an idea from them, we introduce this formal variable and look at this uh, formal formal series of K theory classes. Yeah, so this is a generating series for um, you know containing this K theory class as well as all of all of its tensor powers. Okay. And um, you can apply the index map just term by term to the, to the terms in the series. And that has the effect on, on this formula, on this formula of just exponentiating this part. Yeah. So, so all I've done going from here to here is basically replace this by by e to the e to the t times times that expression. Okay. Um, and then um, yeah, so why What's amazing about this is that now this is a sum of exponentials, okay? And if, if this term wasn't here, there is a formula, there's a, a famous formula for evaluating sum of exponentials like, like that called the Poisson summation formula, okay? So if you add up a infinite sum of exponentials uh, over a lattice like this, it's, it, it gives you a sum of delta distributions on, on the torus. On the, um, and when you have this deformation in here, um, there's a modification of this result. Yeah, you can you can think of this as kind of a change of variables, and then there's this kind of change of variables formula that happens uh, because of the delta function. Okay, and um, and instead of getting delta functions at um, uh, yeah, so 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 the place the the locations where the delta functions are located also gets uh, deformed somehow by by this change. Um, so so you get this really uh, bizarre looking looking formula for how you're supposed to deform the, the delta function. So you're you're supposed to um, move the support of the delta functions to this point g sub t where where the definition of g sub t it's very it's not very explicit but it's just defined to be the thing that satisfies this equation. Okay so this this is something I don't really have time to explain but this is this doesn't involve any gauge theory or any index theory. This is um, this is something where if you look at the ordinary proof of the Poisson summation formula and uh, modify it some at some places, you can you can prove this. Okay, um, so we get this we get this rather exotic looking formula. Okay, um, okay, I have a kind of a summary here. Um, I guess I still have. Do I have about eight minutes? Is that is that right? Or, or am I done? Sorry, I guess I'm done. It was an hour, right? Sorry about that. I lost we, track of time a little bit. We, yeah, we usually go about an hour. So, uh, this is this is probably a good good place to stop. Yeah. So so thank you very much.